For the longest time, I was convinced that I was stupid because I could not think sharply and I could not, for the life of me, figure out how to communicate clearly. My brain felt like it was this blender full of thoughts stuck in some sort of perpetual mixing cycle that I couldn't shut off or even make sense of what ingredients were being thrashed around inside. And because I wasn't able to order my thoughts, when I communicated, it was very unfocused. It was very chaotic. And I sort of just spat opinions out there. There wasn't really any meaningful substance behind my words. Oftentimes when I would have a, a golden idea that I would want to contribute to a dialogue, whenever I spoke, I always felt like I could never get that idea across. I might say something and feel that only 25% of the idea was communicated. And then I would follow that up with a bunch of rough, choppy, janky sentences. And that might add an extra 10% of clarity to the idea. And it always frustrated me because I knew that there was a precise arrangement of words that could get my idea across in a single sentence. What was that combination? I wanted to figure that out. And even outside of social situations, I was so frustrated by my inability to order my thoughts. Why is it that I can't seem to follow a line of thought for more than 15 seconds without my brain derailing and pursuing a rabbit hole and going down some other vein of thought? And why is it that each new piece of information added feels like it's another dirty sock added onto a pile of unfolded laundry, like nothing is getting done here? Because when your brain is in a fog, it's incredibly hard to make decisions and it absolutely kills motivation. For me, I wasn't able to trust my own decisions and could never fully think through a problem to try to come up with solutions. So I began to rely on other people's cerebral horsepower to validate my decisions as either good or bad. And what I slowly began to realize as I shared this frustration with other people and as I interacted with others is that what I was experiencing is actually quite a common problem. And more importantly, it's an increasingly common problem because in this era of information overload that we live in, very few people know how to think sharply, clearly, or to think for themselves in general. And I want to share with you how I've learned and am learning to solve this problem for myself. And so to that effect, I want to start by addressing the culprits, the root causes behind this sensation of brain fog that people are dealing with. And when I really spent some time about a year ago reflecting on each of these four things that we'll talk about, I was surprised at how unaware people are of how much of a negative effect they actually have on your ability to process information and think and how integrated they've become into our routines and how heavily impactful they were to me uh, for the better when I was able to reduce these significantly. So let's talk about number one, and that is the mind curse of bite-sized media. So particularly amongst millennials and Generation Z, the formats that we now consume content in are progressively becoming shorter and shorter, right? That's kind of a no-brainer. The language of the internet in 2022 is short form videos and condensed ideas. TikTok, YouTube shorts, Twitter, Instagram reels, that entire social ecosystem thrives on providing digestible information that's often watered down to make it palatable to as many people as possible. Now, I'm not saying that the content is void of value here. We're not critiquing the substance, but the behavior that the consumption of this content at scale conditions within us is that of engaging our brain for a very short period of time and then recalibrating. For example, let's play through a common browsing pattern in a lot of people on social media. They pull open TikTok, for example. They play through a video that maybe is at a duration of a minute. They might even browse the comment section and maybe they even contribute to the dialogue and leave some two cents of their own. They leave a comment. And then very quickly, they're watching something new. They're scrolling to the next video in the black hole of the scroll, as they call it, and they're recalibrating and their brain is forced to restart its focus and they're training their brain in that way. And to be fair, this idea of people having short attention spans is nothing new. Joe's not getting a Nobel Prize for some revolutionary discovery here. But what I had realized is that I'd conditioned myself to only being able to process information in small quantities. My brain muscles were being trained to being activated for short durations and that carried over to my conversations and my independent thought when I was alone thinking through ideas. I wasn't used to extended moments of concentration because I was used to always filling the boring moments when they arose with something that was stimulating and most of that was short form content in whatever form it took, whether it was tweets, inspirational quotes, 
very short stories or answers on Reddit. They were all short form, bite-sized media forms. And as our brains begin to adapt to these short bursts of engagement, and that conditions this pattern in us and humans adapt incredibly fast, this also brings another side effect to the surface. And one that I noticed also stunted my inability or my ability rather to process information. And that is since most of what we consume online are the end conclusions of someone else's own thoughts, life, or experiences. We are not guided through the steps that they had to go through to arrive at those conclusions and to be able to defend them. It's like trying to be a chef, but only ever getting to work with the meal that's already been prepared, ready to serve to people. Like you don't know what the individual ingredients are. How did you get to the point of having this meal that is ready to be served? The impact of this is that it's led to a population that knows of a lot of great recipes, AKA ideas, thoughts, or arguments, whatever, but they're not able to understand them well. They don't understand them well. They take up dead weight, dead space in their mind. And that's because of one of two reasons. Number one, A, because they've never explored or researched them beyond the person that they heard them from. How often does that happen to us? Or B, more importantly, they haven't been exposed to the nested steps that it took for the person that they heard that conclusion from to be able to reach that conclusion because those conversations, that discussion is boring or oftentimes because it's simply cut for time, which leads us to the second problem. And that is we hastily adopt opinions instead of evaluating them. Here's why this affects your ability to process information and think clearly, because if we merely adopt a thought, without understanding how someone else had to step through information to get to that thought, to arrive at that conclusion, it becomes incredibly difficult to think through it, to communicate it, to defend it effectively, because your understanding is only ever gonna be limited to the basic summation of that argument, the one that you've adopted from someone else. And we do this with so much that comprises the convictions that we have as individuals. We can't defend it because we simply adopted it because it sounds good. People, there are many different uh, concepts to describe this sentiment. Some people call it confirmation bias, where we sort of just blindly upvote things that, that we agree with, not because it's, it's, it's rooted in any sort of fact, but because it aligns with the previous beliefs that we had, even though the, the fact of it is potentially wrong. But the amount of times that I've been in dialogues with people where they've introduced high level concepts into the conversation and I've offered maybe just a little bit of pushback and they cannot even begin to remotely defend their position because their understanding of that high level concept is limited to what they heard from someone else. And they're just parroting those opinions. And to be clear, I'm not some masterful debater poking the perfect holes in arguments. I've just begun to realize that society is full of people who have a very surface level understanding of oftentimes very strong opinions. And I noticed this within myself and it always frustrated me that I could never think through these opinions myself or communicate them effectively because my exposure to them was either always short, limited in some way, or a copy of someone else's and I didn't realize it until I really had to confront myself with that behavior. And so I started asking myself these questions, all these ideas that I have in my head, have I ever really thought through them? How do I know if they're true? What does the opposition say? because there's a huge difference between merely adopting a thought because it sounds good and then really internalizing it through your own due diligence and research and having a vast foundation of knowledge on a subject. And there's a confidence that comes with that. And I think that's what I was missing because when I had an unstable foundation, I found it incredibly hard to think and speak from a position of clarity. And that was so frustrating because I didn't have a comprehensive understanding on really anything because my exposure to those ideas at best was a 10 minute long YouTube video that took a high resolution idea, blurred it down, diluted it, watered, down, watered it down and make it palatable to the masses. And I'm not bagging on any particular channel here or a format of content. The issue lies in the fact that organization of thought and clarity on any particular subject is a long-term discipline. There are no shortage of individuals out there who can tell you a lot of fascinating ideas, thoughts, and opinions, but rare is the individual who has the, who has exercised the mental discipline to study a topic in depth, to explore the different experts in the industry, and who has been able to step outside and look beyond what I call the processed version of the idea. You know, the, the fast food version, the one that's there to hook you, it's simple, it's sugar-coated to 
appeal to our short attention spans. And this leads us to the third problem I want to highlight, and that is info input is massively disproportionate to info output. We live in this era of information overload where we're all forced to pay attention to this mosaic of information. We all have these different information diets and all that input requires a system of order in order for us to sort through the information, to process it, or else our mind becomes overloaded and we humans are incredibly incompetent at sorting things in our own heads. Now, some people are incredibly gifted and they're able to have real internal dialogues with themselves to clarify murky thoughts. But most of us, including myself, need to output information in order to clarify thoughts, arguments, and sort through the ideas that are just scattered in our brains. It's like we've been stuffing things into a closet and spring cleaning is here. We need to take everything out, put it into the open, and only then can we sort through it and discard the Amazon boxes that are just taking up dead space in our closet. We need a process to bring order to our thoughts and ideas. And this is often why conversation is so valuable. When we dialogue with another person, it forces us to channel all these unfocused ideas into a particular selection of words that we communicate to another person that allows us often to modify our stance on our ideas. You receive feedback and oftentimes it alters your thoughts based off the reactions that others give us. We're able to gauge the impact of our thoughts. Sometimes we're met with validation and acknowledgement. Other times pushback and disagreement. Both are healthy responses because both modify our understanding and bring clarity to what our stance is on these thoughts to be able to better defend them. And conversation, by the way, is just one form of output. There's also journaling, writing, video, audio, teaching is another one as well. But the dilemma in society is the fact that people are engaged very little with any meaningful form of output, at least on the thoughts that overwhelm them the most, the ones that are just screaming and begging for clarity. The input of information is skewed to be far greater than our ability to organize those thoughts through output. And I don't know what like the happy medium is, whether we should engage in one hour of output for every hour of consumption, but I do know that input has increased dramatically over this last decade, especially with the prevalence of social media. And we all know the internet can be this fire hose of information and people get overwhelmed very quickly when they're not able to digest and make sense of that flood of information. I would honestly encourage you to ask yourself this question. Let me see if I can phrase this right. What chances are you giving yourself to process the different levels of input that you're engaging with? Because I can tell you my answer. When my brain fog was at its zenith, even just a few months ago, my answer was none. There was no output. I did not allow myself extended moments of concentration. One thing I've learned about recently, actually, is many of the great philosophers, the mathematicians, the Romans, the, the Greeks, like the really big names in those domains of knowledge, whenever they would be engaged in some sort of Senate debate or any moral dialogue, they would always spend a few days afterwards retired in their quarters, writing down their thoughts, giving speeches, giving very short mock orations about these ideas so that they can clarify them in their minds. That ability to process something and have the best thought in the world in the moment after you hear a fresh new idea is rare. It's a superpower that only a select few in the history of humanity have ever been endowed with. And it takes time to process information. And so this actually leads us into one of the four solutions that I want to share with you that are not necessarily in uh, combat to the four problems that we address, but they will indirectly check some of those boxes. The first solution I want to share with you that has massively helped me is to engage in outputting more. Now, speaking from my own clunky attempts at trying to organize my scattered thoughts, your first try at trying to make sense of what is up here is going to be difficult. It was for me, writing doesn't come naturally. Don't expect it to be easy. Because I don't think people realize how often we really just parrot points that we hear from others. And when you're forced to communicate through output, you're training your mind muscles to clarify what you mean. And the beauty of it is that you're using your own words to do so. One method of output that I take some level of personal pride in inventing for myself is what I call mock presentations in front of a fake audience. What I would do is I found an old projector, you can easily get one off of Amazon for relatively an inexpensive fee. 
and I found some old footage of a live audience from YouTube and I would project that onto the wall and then I would deliver, have a one-way conversation with that audience on a topic that I wanted to sort through in my mind. And the purpose of the audience was just to simulate that stage environment and give myself multiple touch points of focus, i.e. the different people that I had to make eye contact with. And it's actually uncanny how nervous I got in preparing to do these mock presentations. I would keep the speeches maybe three to five minutes, just speak on something that I wanted to clarify and work through and figure out how I would deliver this if I had to communicate this to another person. And I really do enjoy those. I actually still do them to this day. And those mock presentations is a great form of output. I also tried writing as well which is actually considered to be more focus intensive than conversation itself. Writing, I actually found to be more effective than speaking and performing the mock presentations to the fake audience because writing allowed me to gauge the effectiveness of each sentence in order to, in relation to the whole point that I was making. And I could revise and change the order as, as I wanted in order to bring further clarity to the thought that I was trying to put on paper. I would also often revisit writing about the same topic multiple times. I would pull up in a blank document again from scratch and write about shipping containers for the second time, which is actually just a book that I finished reading through. And that round two would allow me to bring a further level of clarity to that thought. And the best part of all this is, here's the beauty, is that those ordered thoughts now serve as a reference for when you engage in speaking or dialoguing with someone. You're not forced in real time to piece together all these unfocused thoughts in a conversation. You have a reference and that is your, your written output that you've engaged in. The second thing that made a huge difference was I made an effort to read full articles and listen to entire conversations on a singular topic. I know this sounds trivial, but it made a huge difference in my ability to think through an idea. Because the goal here is to understand how people step through information to come to a conclusion or a conclusion that you might hold as true or valid. What is supporting that? Instead of merely just adopting someone else's end argument or conclusion, whatever it is, because it sounds right or because it's aligned with your convictions. Podcasts can be really helpful for finding these kinds of conversations, but I would encourage you to try to find podcasts that focus on a singular topic that you're interested in. A lot of podcasts, can get derailed in conversation really, really quickly. And it's like constantly getting split in a new direction every five seconds, which doesn't make it much different from short form content. Like we talked about the issues with earlier. I've actually become an avid reader of books, particularly in this last year for this reason, because books provide a very comprehensive overview of usually a singular topic. And as someone who's always struggled with digesting information from books in particular, one little exercise that I found to be super helpful was after each chapter of a book, I would rehearse out loud the information that I've just read. If I'm not able to make sense of what I just read, then I would revisit and reread the chapter. I would even oftentimes take my phone, record a voice memo of me relaying the information out loud and then listen through that. And the benefit of all this is it helps to create multiple touch points for absorbing information. You have reading, you have speaking, you have listening. And I found I retained information infinitely better that way when I engaged in all those three. Just as a side note, if you do decide to listen to people talk about a topic that is of interest to you, do try to find people to listen to who you want to think like. This is why great orators are often so revered by the public is because they're able to make sense of the unresolved thoughts in our mind. They provide order for us. They're able to voice feelings that we can express for ourselves and make sense of all the chaos around us. And that's actually a very dangerous superpower if you really consider it. And keep in mind too that these, these experts that you listen to and that we see surfaced all over the internet, they've given years and years and massive cognitive energy to researching and understanding these topics. So it's expected that they would speak very, very clearly on it, which is why it is good to listen to these, these full-fledged discussions. And the reason why these discussions are, are so valuable is oftentimes when people speak, especially if they're very seasoned in their respective domain of knowledge, they speak in frameworks and they speak in patterns and we subconsciously pick up on those and can internalize those as a way of working through thoughts and processing information. You might notice that this particular person plays devil's advocate a lot, and maybe that's something that you can apply to your own thoughts that you're trying to work through. So pay attention to those processing tools that a lot of these black belt level thinkers use. The third thing that I did is I reduced the amount of short form content that I consumed. Now, short form content isn't a bad thing, but in today's social media climate, it is terribly easy to become overwhelmed 
by too much information and max out our mental hard drives. It's just far too easy to do that. The quickest way to overwhelm yourself and to reduce your mental capacity is to try to upload a thousand different ideas at once. It's better to have a few select ideas that you really, really understand at high resolution rather than 50 ideas that sound great, but you don't really are able to, you, you aren't able to defend them or you can't execute on them in any meaningful way. I don't think people realize that we only have a certain amount of mental energy that we can devote towards the things that we interact with. And if that is split between 25, 50, 100 different ideas that we come across because of short form content, and we do that every single day, we're constantly fracturing our mind's capacity in a thousand different directions. And this is often the inherent problem with a lot of social media feeds is that they present us ideas that are often unnecessary or not worth our time, but nonetheless, they take up mental space. They live rent free in our brains sometimes. It's like trying to build, I guess, a brick wall, but instead of building vertically with ideas that you really understand, you're building laterally. And so you have this wide breadth of knowledge of a bunch of different things, but that knowledge is very shallow. And so the best course of action that I was able to take action on myself was to reduce the amount of external stimuli, particularly short form content that I exposed myself to and start to be more intentional with the information that I sought out. Number four, adjusting my diet and tracking the effects of certain foods. I realize you may think this to be trivial and it might not sound as much of a solution as some of the other ideas we talked about, but I promise you it significantly reduced the brain fog that I used to deal with. One of the dietary changes that I made to improve my cognitive abilities was to actually not eat carbohydrates, carbs, until about noon. So I would not eat them in the morning whatsoever because when I was trying to troubleshoot why I could not think clearly, I actually kept a food log for about two weeks where I would write down each hour of the day, how I felt, how my mental clarity was and what foods that I was eating. And a pattern started to develop where every single time that I would eat carbs in the morning, within half an hour, my mental clarity would just tank significantly. I actually asked a doctor about this and the simple explanation that he gave is that my body would go into processing overload, trying to digest all that food, the carbs, and that would take energy away from my brain, which made it very difficult to process any sort of information in the mornings. And so not eating carbs until early afternoon has made a huge difference for me, but I realize that it may be different for every single person. And I'm not here to suggest a blanket solution diet wise, but my recommendation would be as I did to keep a food log, track the different hours throughout the day and note down the foods that you may be consuming because they may be potential mental clarity blockers. So just recapping, trying to think clearly and sharply has been this massive undertaking that I've tried to spearhead for myself over this past year. And I hope these thoughts have helped. I really can't stress enough how important it is to be watchful of what we input into our brains and our bodies as well, because whether it's processed food or gosh, processed opinions, Mental clarity can often be increased simply by decreasing the things that only serve to overload us, but we justify consuming because it's convenient in the moment. So keep that in mind and also engaging in some form of output because output is a mechanism that helps us clarify and sort through the information that we have jam packed in our mental brain closets. And when we output that, it helps us develop better mental models for the ideas and the thoughts that we have. And that's something that can improve mental clarity for each person. So on that note, thanks for watching.